Hello there and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crestorio 2 and in today's video we'll see how Mike has been jaunting around the universe, going around and building things up and occasionally having the odd issue or two here and there. And his first project was out here in Wexovis, and this is this is the orbit around a particular star um, out there, the Wexovis star. And if we look out on the on the map, we can see this is the one we were talking about last week, which is blooming miles away from um, from Kalidus, But that doesn't matter because it's uh, because it's uh, close to Melancholia, and this is a place where we're going to be getting Naquitite from. This is nearby, and so if we look at the uh, if we look at the actual surface, we can see that, yes, we've got the beam emitter here, and that's running very nicely, squirting power over there. And we had a bit of a look at that last time, and. Uh, uh, but he's been doing a little bit more sort of finishing off around here and he's got this nice sort of, sort of aesthetically planned and built and arranged uh, layout going on here with these sort of big pluses in the middle and the uh, and the extra bits around the edge. Now he's not quite got there yet. As you can see we've not quite got enough power here because while he was building he ran out of the uh, the Naquium solar panel so you can see there's, a, there's only a part, we're only part built over here and there's a little bit of finishing off to be done. However this is pretty close. I'd say he's at a point where things are working pretty nicely and I wonder if, if we come over here and can we can we rotate one of these we cannot rotate one of these what about one of these um or ooh, actually maybe we could just nudge it no or that one no no we can't we can't move any of this stuff i was attempting to slightly reduce the amount of power that's going into the energy beam emitter over here because i suspect there's plenty of it going through and that would mean that we would then have an extra gigawatt or so which would be enough to be able to allow this to run ab at absolutely 100 percent but um it looks like that's not really a possibility however you can see here the sort of the, the design that's going on he's repeated this sort of the plus with its surrounding um power bits over here for the dimensional anchor and in total once this is finished once we've scraped together enough naquium solar panels this is going to be producing enough power to run the dimensional anchor and the uh, beam emitter at the same time and keep everything happy he's even done a nice sort of diagonal uh, pattern with the with the cables over here as well I, I don't know whether that was deliberate or whether it just happened to fall out like this but it looks quite nice so yes that that comes from a, a request that was made in one of the <laughs> one of the video comments to make our uh, solar builds a little bit more aesthetic and a little bit more pleasing rather than just a massive rectangle rectangular block of solar panels that goes on forever. So yeah, I'd say he's done that quite nicely. That beam emitter is pointed at this receiver over on Melancholia, which is then hooked up to all of these power systems around here. So as usual, we've got the, we've got the pairs of uh, high temperature heat exchangers, each one feeding into a high temperature turbine generator. And then we had a little bit of a debate about how many uh, condenser turbines you needed. It turns out it is actually only two. For some reason, one of us, I think it was me, had a feeling it might have been three. And Mike wasn't sure exactly what was going on because he noticed that the steam was building up in one of these. But, but it turns out that was just the steam that's being used in the buffer to generate the power from. So that's okay. We do know notice that we've jammed up on the amount of output water here uh, and that's due to uh, Mike not having taken enough underground space pipes with him so we've got a few more we're going to ship a few more of those out to him and then once he's got those then all of these will be able to kick in nicely we'll push all the water out around here up here and back into the tank up here at which point it can then be reboiled and go through the system again and there's a yeah there's another problem down here with the same sort of piping which means these ones over here haven't kicked in however at the moment this outpost is still quite small and therefore having one gigawatt of generation over here is probably going to be enough. Yes, you can see here we're, we're, we're gener able to generate about a gigawatt and we're currently using 30 megawatts and that's a lot less so this is absolutely fine. It also helps that most of this seems to have shut down which is a little bit odd and we're going to try and work out why that is in a moment. He's also put in a um, water water ice, well put a, we're bringing in all the various different resources, well lots of the different resources that are needed here. You can see the water ice coming across here being brought down then melted down into water and that's, that's there available to be used both for power generation and also for sulfuric acid production so here we've got again sulfur and uh, iron ingots coming in being made into sulfuric acid here which is filling up this tank and well we'll wait and see whether one of these machines is going to be enough I suspect it's probably not because I remember needing two of these over in Stardust and we're expecting this system to produce about the same amount of naquitite as we're producing over in Stardust and so therefore it should require about the same amount of, uh, of sulfuric acid so we may be looking at a second one of these at some point but if so that's not going to be particularly difficult we can move nudge these across a little bit have another uh, loader bringing more iron things out bring it over here, splitter on this solar sulfur belt, and then that'll be easy enough to put in a second machine down here. I don't see there being any problems with that, it's just something that's going to need to be done. Uh, oh, bringing the water over might be slightly fiddly, but I'm sure it's all well within Mike's capabilities. That sulfuric acid then gets passed over to the uh, to the mines. Um, so far we've got, well, we've got, he's got he's set up two mining patches over here, because on the, he's picked a sensible asteroid to start on, which has a decent chunk of nacrotite there, and a, a smaller but still healthy chunk down here. So those are all covered in mining drills. The only problem with this patch here 
is there's a small patch of raw rare metals here. You can see if I zoom out to, to this sort of level, you can almost just about see the difference in color there. This is a slightly deeper purple than this one, but they're very, very similar. You can see why I struggle when there's only one of them visible. Um, so yeah, this is running, this caused some problems. It's working mostly. We are getting a decent flow of, um, of, of the Naquitite out. However, some of these drills, like this one here, has failed because if we if we take a look at it, then it's it's looking for, it's, it's full of sulfuric acid, but it's trying to mine raw rare metals because there's a bit of each underneath it. You can see over there it's capable of digging up 211,000 raw rare metals and 1,000 naquitite and unfortunately the mines are not intelligent enough to go aha I'm full of sulfuric acid therefore I'll mine the naquitite which requires sulfuric acid rather than mining the raw rare metals which requires chlorine so it's it's not very smart and I don't see how you could really get around this when these two patches are right next to each other like this because you can't feed both of those fluids into the drills because that won't work. So when when it's going to flick back and forth between them, it's yeah. I don't know. How, I don't know if there's actually any way that you could dig up all of the naquitite from this patch. However, lots of the other drills are working fine. As you can see, we are getting some uh, naquitite coming out over here. So that's sort of it's ba it's basically okay. We have found a weird edge case though. So we've got quite a high level of mining productivity. We've got plus 120%. So every time a drill runs, it spits out 2.2 um, pieces of whatever it's mining. Well, that's not quite true actually. Each time a drill runs, the, this bar will go up by um, one and a bit times. The, um, so we'll get, so for the, in this case of this one, where it's just mining naquitite, and under this is, uh, there is 51,000 naquitite, nothing else. Each time it runs, it will run and it'll spit out a piece of naquitite. But while it's doing that run, this bar will have filled up, it'll spat out an extra piece of naquitite, and then it'll fill up another 20%. And then the next time it'll go through, it'll spit out another piece, and then we'll get the, the normal one dug up, and so on and so on. Which means every so often you'll get um, two or three pieces, of, no, you get two pieces of naquitite out at the same time when they happen to line up. However, we've discovered that if the drill gets to its next thing it's going to dig up being one of the bits of raw rare metal. It doesn't use up any acid if it if it digs that up from the productivity bar rather than from the normal production bar. And so that means even though we don't have any chlorine here, we've still managed to get a few pieces of raw rare metal coming out here. We've got up to 12 of them it turns out. And that's a bit weird because in theory we shouldn't be able to mine up any raw rare metals from here because we don't have any chlorine. It should just jam the drills as has happened here. But it seems that with that weird productivity trick, um, number two you will, everyone will hate, um, it turns out that you can get small amounts of rare metals coming out and that's not ideal. So in order to get around that we've, we've decided that we don't expect very very much of it to come out because as I say the drills will jam. So we've just put filters on the output uh, loaders over here and we'll just let that raw rare metal sit there and, and, and stew. I mean, what, what, it, it, it can just sit there. We don't really care because it's not taking up a significant amount of space in this warehouse and we don't expect to get very much of it out there, out of here. Uh, so I suspect that all of the drills that are capable of digging up any raw rare metals have now jammed. So that one's jammed. You can see all by the red lights. Jammed, 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 jammed. So it's only ones down here. That one can't get any raw rare metal, nor can that one, or that one, or that one, or that one. So all of the ones that could potentially have a problem have now had the problem and failed and so we won't, we shouldn't get any more um, rare metals out of there. Shouldn't. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of emphasis on the word shouldn't there. <laughs> We are going to need to think about more belts coming through here, I suspect. I, I don't actually, I don't know. When this is running, I don't know how fast it produces it, because it seems to have jammed up along here, which we're going to have to have a look into in a moment. But that will come a bit later on in the video, once we start talking about what's going on at the other end of this um, Arcolink storage. And so this is what we would call a proof of concept. Uh, we have we have all of the production systems running. It's just on a fairly small scale at the moment. So we have power being generated at a third of the rate we would like it to be generated at. We have mining being done at a reduced rate. We have sulfuric acid being produced. Now this may be okay. We'll, we'll see how it goes, but we may need to boost that. But the, the next step with this is going to be to build a railway system. Gosh, look at all this. There's a, there's a railway system coming to, coming together over here. And so that is going to be then running out. How far has he got with this? Um, Okay, so he's, he's started tagging all of the naquitite patches he wants to dig. That's, that makes a lot of sense because they're so hard to spot. Um, so we've got a load, of, a, a big cluster over here. This is really nice. We've got, I mean, these aren't particularly huge, but we've got uh, a million there, which isn't bad. Uh, 1.7 there, 3.2. Come on, tell me, tell me what the patch is. I, I can't tell what the patch is. There's a here in the way. <laughs> Another 1.6 million here, uh, and but then these are all rare metals. So these are these these together are actually quite a nice, healthy patch. So if he puts in a station here, has the, all of these feed in to get into the same uh, station, then that's going to run really, really nicely. 
And then we've got railway going off in, in other directions. Oh, there's a nice patch over here. There's another 3 million. That's raw rare metals, of course. And so, yeah, that he, Mike has been doing some tagging of the places he would like to go next. Um, and and that's going to be a good start. And as he carries on, well, we'll then eventually probably come out to these ones over here. And so on and so on. And eventually we'll get... I don't know, I don't know exactly how much you need to get to, to have a decent flow coming through. Um, but he, but he'll get there eventually. And then down here we've got... That's rare, that's rare metals. But that one's an aquatite. But unfortunately it's right next to some more rare metals. So again, we'll have the same problem there. But yeah, if, if, as necessary, we can, we can do more exploring. We can do more searching for decent patches, and we should get a good amount, a good healthy amount flowing through, flowing through the system. This nacrotite, as I was saying, finds its way out of the warehouse, then goes up these belts into the uh, into the Arcalink storage here, and that teleports it all off to Talos, as we as we were discussing last week. Um, and this is all going to be achieved eventually. We're going to be using deep space loaders and deep space belts all the way around here to get a good flow of it going through, because we want to get ideally the, these things are expensive, so we want to use them to their maximum capability. So ideally, we want to have seven solid deep space belts of Naquitite flowing through here, and that that's a lot. So we're going to need there's going to need to be quite a lot of expansion before we can get there. But that's that's okay. We uh, we we're, we're sort of we're okay, we're ready for that. We we uh, we we know we're going to need quite a lot of throughput here, and we'll work work on expanding that as we go. Now, in theory, in the future, if we decide we need even more throughput, we could move the pulverization steps over to here, have a big pulverization facility, and then feed through the crushed Naquitite through these deep space loaders. But I suspect that's going to be more than we're going to need. I think, and also, I think that might be more than we can reasonably uh, harvest in on this in this uh, asteroid field without spending a lot of time building out trains out to further and further and further away Nequim patches. So I think we're going to be sticking with just feeding through the uh, the normal Nequitite. But the interesting thing about this is we now are we are using the deep space loaders over here, um, not to their full potential yet, sure, but we have we have put them in and we are using them. And that meant that I had to make them over here in Norvis orbit. And so we've got another machine here on the top. This is this is the uh, the U the, uh, the big long pillar of construction, which to be honest is getting beyond the limits of realms of sanity at this point. It's still smaller than our solar field, though. Um, yes, yeah, so up here, right at the top, we are trying. We're making the deep space loaders. These things are expensive. If we take take a look at the recipe here. You can see we're, we need to bring in quantum processors and quite a lot of them, a lot of nanomaterial, naquium cubes, heavy assemblies, immersion gear wheels, and then a normal space loader and um, transport belt and some loop. Uh, those those things aren't too difficult. But most of this actually, what was producing the stuff is quite expensive. Bringing it in here wasn't too bad. So as you can see, we've got the uh, we've got the the quantum processors there on a belt here. We've got the the nanomaterials on a belt, we've got the Naquim cubes on a belt, the heavy assemblies are on a belt over here, the um, immersion plates are coming up over here and so it's just sticking a machine like this to smack them into um, into shape as, as the gears and they can be fed in. And then, but I decided that because we weren't expecting to use particularly huge quantities of these, I would bring the, uh, the the loaders and the deep space belts over by bot, which, as you know, I don't really like doing that. However, it's a fair way from where the belts are being made and uh, the deep space belts are being made down, I, I don't even know where, somewhere down here. Uh, here we go, here are the deep space belts. And so to bring those up on the bus would have meant putting so many of them onto the onto a belt that it just it didn't seem it didn't seem worthwhile. And the deep space loaders are being made blooming miles away, I don't even know where. Although perhaps I, I could have built them on site, like I've been doing with the space belts and splitters and so on for the deep space belts and splitters and so on. I could have done that. Um, I don't know whether that would have been better or worse, but anyway, over here, I've, I've done the, I've done it with bots. They're being brought over, and they're being unloaded into a red chest here, so they can be claimed as necessary. So we've made 82 of them now, which is actually quite a lot, especially if there's only 20 of them in here. It makes kind of makes me wonder where they've all gone because Mike has had about, Mike has had eight of them. Um, and there's 20 in there, and I don't know where the rest are. Uh, I suspect some of them could potentially be useful for places like these scrap, this is not scrap, places like the scrap processing over here where we've got these, um, where we're trying to feed large quantities of scrap in and out of this warehouse. So using deep space loaders here would be quite a good place to use them, but we're not. These are all just standard space loaders and it seems to be okay. I kind of don't know where all the rest of them have gone. And factory search says there are none being used in Norbit. I could do an all surfaces search, this will take a while. And this shows that there are eight of them on Melancholia as predicted, but... I don't know where all the other ones have gone. They must have been taken out of the box and gone into people's inventories. Perhaps I perhaps I claimed more than I intended to, and um, I've ended up with another extra 40 of them. That seems seems odd, though. But yeah, we've produced 82 of them, and we've got 20 in here. 
and that leaves about 50 unaccounted for, so I am slightly puzzled by that. Once I had the deep space loaders, I was able to just chuck them straight into the into the Arco link over on Talos, and that immediately teleported them out to uh, to Mike in over in Melancholia, so he was able to use them. And we've used this a few times actually. We've sent a number of things out to him using this system. So he's had uh, a few extra things. All I sent all the trains over to him that way. I sent a few machines that he'd forgotten. It's basically it's a really convenient way of getting extra stuff over to him when he's um, when he's not set when he's not remembered everything that he needs for a build. And um, I don't say that in a, in a mocking way because I don't think I've ever gone out and done a build and not forgotten half the stuff I wanted to take with me. So uh, yeah, and we've got a few extra things down here in, the, in this um, in this requester chest that at some point we'll pass we'll flip this uh, insert around. They can be passed through uh, because he'd gone at the end of the last stream when I when I put these in here. But this means they can easily be sent over to him when he's ready for them. And as you can see, this is working very, very nicely. We have large quantities of Nacrotite that has poured through the uh, the Arcalink storage, and that's gone over to all of the machines that have been set up over here. And they're now pulverizing it down as exactly as you'd hoped. And, and this this seems to be working marvelously. So we've, we've got the uh, the Nacrotite pouring out, going, in, going into the machines, it's then being pulverized down, and we've got the various the mixture of stuff coming out here. We're sorting out the bits that we want to keep, the bits we don't want to keep, and then the bits we want to recycle and the bits we want to actually use for production. And this is now all backed up. You can see if we follow the belt down here, this where house down here is absolutely full. It's not absolutely full. What's going on? Um, oh, there is a rotated underground belt here. So let's flip that round. Let's start chucking this through and then we'll start using the stuff that's coming from Melancholia. And that will mean that we'll, if we allow that to run, well, you can see we're going to start pulling this through. And that means these machines up here can gradually kick into motion. Uh, and that means we're now starting to pull through the, the Nacrotype from here. So we've got more Nacrotype coming through from the from the Arcolink storage. And that means if we go back to Melancholia, you can see we've got these three belts running up here out of the warehouse. That means this belt is flowing. That means these belts can start to flow. And yeah, as, it was as I was suggesting that the uh, the proof of concept with this little little mine here um, is actually not capable of producing an entire space belt's worth of um, of Nacrotype. So. As I say, it's a proof of concept. It's not finished. It's gonna. It needs a lot more mines to be put in. But you know, you can only do one thing at a time. So uh, this is uh, this is absolutely fine. We'll uh, we'll we'll pull through all of this nacrotite and then go. Well, we seem to have run out. And then uh, and Mike can go. Oh no, you've used it all up and built some more mines. So that's that's fine. That's exactly how we expect it to go. But it does show that the system over here at the other end is working very nicely. It's pulverizing it all down. And uh, as as it comes through, we can you can see down here that the. Uh, the, the iridium plates are being passed straight through back into the pulverizer, and we can then. But then, occasionally, when we need more, we can load them in with the insert with this inserter here, and then the powder down here will be will be filtered out. That goes over to here, where we now have the enriched vulcanite and the iridium ingots being brought over by by spaceship, along with all of the other stuff that's required for making um, for making naquium. It's all going into the same spaceship because there's a good there's a spaceship there. There's a system set up and working. Why would I mess with it? And as you can see, the system here is more than fast enough to deal with all of the uh, the powder that's coming through. Cook it back down into the into ingots and pass it through. And again, I've got the prioritization system over here where we're using an inserter for the top up and a an express and a loader for the things we actually want to get rid of. So it'll, we'll always use the stuff from here before we use this one. But this is always available for a top up when it's required. And that should keep all of this running very, very nicely. And it seems to be. And so we have loads and loads of uh, loads and loads of crushed nacrotite over here. Um, it's, we, we now have a sort of a little bit of a fight going on as to whether it's going to be brought in, but loaded from the train or from the, this belt system. I don't think it actually really matters which input we use. The hope is that eventually we'll get to the point where the whole system is running fast enough that we're using it from both inputs more or less in, um, well, probably in roughly equal quantities, but we're just churning through it nice and quickly, getting through everything. And so all of, all of the mines are in use and we have a nice happy flow of Naquium coming out here and being sent off into the train to be taken back over to the other planet, yada, yada, yada. I touched on it a little bit at the other end, but in order to get this system running and, uh, and working nicely and producing the sulfuric acid, we have a feed of ice and iron and sulfur all coming in here that can be fed into the uh, into the Arcolink storage and will go in the opposite direction. And to make sure things don't get too out of hand, we've got a control system over here that's, that's monitoring, that's getting a signal over from Melancholia that's telling us how which which things we're short of. So if we ever start to run low on any of those, then oh, there we go, there's some sulfur running through. And it'll, that'll flow until Melancholia says, no, actually, I've got enough of it. So you see, there we go, it's stopped again now. But that can be pumped into the Arcolink, it'll come out the other end, it'll go into storage, and then we'll say, okay, we've now got enough, you can stop, you can stop passing that through. So this works in exactly the same way that every other system with the spaceships does. However, because we have a much lower latency system because we're using an Arcolink chest over here, it's much, much quicker, it's much easier, and we can just pass, pass it through basically on, on demand as it's required. We do still need to start feeding train batteries and meteor defense ammunition through here, and that's gonna be done in exactly the same way. We'll have another two belts coming in, pass it through as it's required. However, that's going to be a little bit more complicated because up in Ta 
law bit. Yes, those things are being brought over. You can see here we've got uh, train batteries and we've got, we don't, we don't seem to have meteor defense ammo, so I need to build a meteor defense system. For some reason, we don't seem to have one in Talos. I think, oh, then, no, no, take it back. There is one on the ground on Talos, um, so we need to upgrade that and have one up in space that gets the, where the ammunition is brought in from here. And so we're going to then need to start feeding small amounts of the ammunition and the train batteries into this train here in order to get them sent down to the ground in order to then ship them over out off to Melancholia to keep that area supplied. It's not going to be exactly difficult, but it is a thing that I'm going to need to organize and make sure it's up and working and, and behaving itself nicely and, and shipping everything through to where it needs to be. Because we're using the Arcalinks for two-way transport and of, of many, many different things, we need to make sure that we don't just fill it up with anything. And so we, we're doing that by, well, for the stuff that's being brought out to here, we've got a cable going to a signal transmitter here, so we know that we, we, we know that we always request when there's less than a certain amount of something. And you can see the negative numbers on there. That's a standard shopping list thing. So we will only pass through when there's less than zero of whatever. So at the moment, for example, there is 58 sulfur in here. We're subtracting 50 from that. That means there's eight sulfur being sent on the over the transmission system. And so that's greater than zero. So we're not feeding any extra sulfur into the in, in, into the system over there. Oh, we then used some of it up. So now we are feeding some through. This will get back up to whatever. And then we'll, we'll, we'll stop it running. That's, that, that, that's all fine. That works, that works nicely. The other part of it is we need to make sure that it doesn't fill up with naquitite. And so to do that, we're monitoring what's in the actual chest itself. And we're saying only feed additional naquitite in when there's less than 20 in there. And we came up with 20. Uh, sort of 20 is not just an arbitrary random number. Uh, 20 is, is, is two stacks. So that means there's going to always, if it, even if it's full, and even if, the, even if the belts go a little bit over, then we shouldn't have more than three stacks in there, even if, even if things go, get, get a little bit carried away. And 20 is enough that the system at the other end can feed out two, two pieces onto all seven belts at the same time and then it'll and then the number in there will only drop down to six which means the feeding in what the other end will kick in we'll put some more in and this means as long as we have sufficient input coming from the coming from the mines and the belts we should always be able to get a solid flow through but without having more than so two or maybe three stacks ever buffered inside the chest and if there's only two or three stacks buffered in the chest then there's plenty of room to feed all this stuff through because that's only going to be coming in at sort of one at one belt and it's being unloaded at the same speed at the other end so we shouldn't ever run into any problems with this chest filling up and jamming the, uh, the, the logistics system. Um, I say shouldn't. We, I'm pretty confident in this. I think it should be absolutely fine. The, there's a, a slight risk when we feed through all of these meteor defense installations. But again, I don't expect that to be a problem because they'll all be passed straight out by the, by the unloader and put into the warehouse at the other end. Or will they? No, they actually won't because we've got filters set on this unloader over here. Now, this is going to be okay in the long run because we only need to put, we need to put train batteries and meteor defense ammo onto here as well. Uh, and that then it'll be complete, but then it'll be completely full. But that does mean when we start loading in the uh, the guns and the and the belt and the pipes and things, Mike is going to have to grab them out by hand manually. But that's fine because he's going to be out there building it all up anyway. So I don't see any problem with that. Uh, if we were desperate, we could use another one of these loaders to pull it out. But we don't we don't want to do that in the long term. And as a brief side note, while I'm talking about these loaders, we had a we had a query as to whether it would be quicker to use a single deep space loader like this going onto a deep space belt, or whether it would be quicker to have a, a pair of superior long inserters running from the running from one storage system into another doing direct insertion. So I did a little bit of testing in the uh, in the blueprint editor here, as you can see. And if I uh, let's just copy this over to here, because then we can then we get well, then we can see it being demonstrated. So there we go. You can see these are now running. They're passing the naquitite through reasonably quickly here. Um, um, but however, you'll notice this belt is running in, in, in jerks and spurts like this. So from this, we can tell that the uh, the belt going into a loader like this, and this is, put, this is, okay, granted this is a purple one, not a deep space one, but they're the same speed, so it doesn't matter, is actually faster than using the inserters like this. What I could do is, I mean, I could put in an extra pair of inserters there and there like that, and then, then we fill, then we just fill the container at the end up. Uh, let's move it across like that. So then we do this again. And now you can see this is running solidly and the amount in here is going down. So if we could get four inserters running in the space of a belt, then it would actually be faster. But we can't do that because if this was actually the uh, the archer chest over here, then we would have another, would, that would be a two by two. So we'd then have a, it would be, we'd have another belt and another loader running into it. So from this, we learned that it's noticeably quicker to use the, the belts and the loaders than it is to use the inserters, which is a little bit of a shame because we had the inserters already being made, but I had to start making the deep space loaders in order to get this sort of speed out of it. Um, so... In a way, it's, it's, it's sort of a shame, but on the other hand, having the inserters going through each other the way you could see them doing there when you've got two of them in, in a row like that, that looks kind of weird and slightly broken and I'm not entirely a fan of it, so 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy that, in, in a way, I'm quite happy that we're using loaders, not inserters for this, even if it is slightly worse for UPS. And once he'd finished up to, well, that, that stage of finishedness, uh, Mike hopped in the deep space exploration and flew back. Unfortunately, he discovered as he was launching that he didn't really have enough fuel left. It turns out that taking off from a space platform uses about a thousand ion stream and uh, flying back from Melancholia to, uh, to Norvis via Fenestra uses more than he had left after that launch. And so the, uh, the ship is now stranded and it's stranded in somewhere in the spatial distortion, which is um, interesting. I'm not quite sure exactly how it, what's going to happen here. Um, we could consider flying another ship out to there to try and refuel it, do a sort of a rescue mission thing. Or we could leave it limping back and then when it gets to Kalidas Asteroid Belt 2, go out and do a rescue mission from there. Uh, there, are, there are multiple possibilities available. They're, none of them are especially great. Uh, basically, it's a good idea to keep an eye on your fuel gauge, especially when you're about to go off on a long journey. And make sure you've got enough fuel to get there and back again. <laughs> um, he does still have plenty of heat. He's only got, he's got through less than 20% uh, of the available heat in the uh, heat exchanger here. Sorry, in the energy beam receiver here. And I say 20% because it's, about, it's, it's just over 9,000. And these systems will run until it gets down to 5,000 degrees C. So he's, got, he's used up almost 1,000 out of the 5,000 available because if it gets to if it gets down to a thousand then the system can't run anymore although we do have an emergency system to deal with that with the antimatter reactor here where we can you know, we can get antimatter out of this container here put it into here and that will warm up the uh, the energy beam receiver here effectively passing the heat through into the heat exchanger and then the uh, turbine generator however he doesn't have any emergency uh, ion stream with him because that would require more forward planning than we've uh, than, than we've um, than we had available at the time <laughs> so this ship is it's not stranded, it is moving at limp speed, as you can see up here, we're moving at a speed of uh, 0.37, uh, and, well, it's going to take this long to get out of the spatial distortion, and goodness knows how long to fly to anywhere useful. As I was saying, I don't know if you can fly another ship out to dock with it in the spatial distortion, this may be a downside of using the Fenestra shortcut. But, well, it's um, not my problem, except in that it's going to limit my Nequitite inputs, so we'll see how Mike sorts himself out next time. He said he's currently limping home, so I think that means he intends to try and get a decent distance back at limp speed, and we'll find out how, what he does after that. During the last stream, I also managed to get all of my building work finished on, uh, on over on Talos, and that includes all of the modules. So uh, Mark has been working really hard stepping up the production of all of the Vitamelange uh, pro products, and that's meant we've been able to make loads and loads of productivity modules. So I've bumped all of these machines over here. They're now all tier 5 productivity in here, which means we're getting a plus 48% productivity boost on everything that comes out of here. And that's one of the big advantages to doing the pulverizing down on the planet, and why, and is part of why we're bringing this through as Naquitite rather than as crushed Naquitite. Because it means for every naquitite we dig up, we're getting about one and a half na crushed naquitites, or at least one and a half times as much crushed naquitite out. So I guess for every four we dig up, we're getting one and a half out. So it is, it is still about an extra or extra 50% coming through, and that's, that's quite valuable. Uh, it's also meant I've been able to put in all of the modules down here, so we've now got tier sevens in all of these uh, furnaces, all of the machines that handle the actual naquium uh, production, because again, it's an expensive, expensive production system, so we want to, we want to get the best in there that we can. And so looking through here, you can see as, as we go through, the two, the two sets of chemical plants are both running at plus 64%. We've got the centrifuges running at plus 32%. We've got the furnaces over here running at plus 80%. And with a plus 48% from up here. Well, if I put all those numbers on screen and multiply them together, then you can see that that's quite a big Im improvement over the amount we get if we didn't use the productivity modules. <clears throat> <laughs> I've also been able to finish upgrading all the modules over here. So now we have, this is, this is tier three, no, sorry, tier six uh, speed modules in here. And and tier 6 productivity modules in all of the beryllium production over here and that's got us a certain amount of extra beryllium coming out and the same over here on this side and if we look back over the last 10 hours we can see we had a nice steady production at about 1.1 thousand per minute and then this is presumably where I put in those improvements and we're now up at 1.3 thousand so that's an extra 20 percent and that's definitely not to be sniffed at. Also notably in the, in the same sort of time over, over the recent let's look at the last hour we've been making about 1200 well it's now up to 1300 per minute and we've, but we've only been using about 880 900 per minute and so that that's a big improvement. That means we're now using it up s more slowly than we are producing it. And so hopefully that means we're now starting to fill up all of the beryllium buffers around the, around the factory and we will soon have enough of it. 
I suspect some of this is down to us having had enough uh, low density structures because we've caught up again. If you look over here at this warehouse, it's it's mostly full. A train has just pulled in and taken 160 stacks because that's what trains do. And we're now filling it back up again. But as you can see, we are only 80 or so stacks away from having this warehouse full again. So yes, we're using quite a lot of beryllium right now, but we'll um, but we'll 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 fill the train up and then it'll then it'll all calm down again. We are also actually we're pulling through quite a lot of the scaffolds over here. But again, the train a train has probably just pulled in. We're about it. We're about half a train's worth away from having that full filled up again. So gen in general, the beryllium production or gen beryllium consumption has gone down a lot since we were having all those problems earlier because we've started to refill a lot of the buffers. Looking up in Norbit, yeah, we're still, well, actually, I was going to say we're still ripping through a lot of low density structures. We're actually not, but that's because we've run out of heat shield tiles and therefore we've stopped making space scaffolding, which is another problem, but that's going to be one for another time. We'll deal with that uh, in, in the next stream, but suffice to say, we've run out there and maybe we'll take a bit of a look at that in the next video. We're also not doing any astro related science at the moment, and so that potentially means that we've filled up the buffers over in the science area with all of the astro everything. So let's see if we can find them. Here they are. Yes, yeah, so they've stopped, and that's another place where beryllium is is no longer being used because we've got we've got enough of all of the uh, of all the things that are being made from it. And I imagine if we, let's take a look down at the yes, this is where the astro science itself is actually being done. We're we're not even making cutting beryllium up into plates here to make into the into these frames to make into every into, into everything else. Well, actually, no. Take that back. These are these are running a little bit. We are getting through a little bit of astro science down here. A little bit of beryllium is being used down here, but it's fairly insignificant. On all these machines, these are very slow. They're all. They're, I've just put in lots and lots of machines, rather than smaller numbers of machines and speed beacons and modules and things. This shows how long ago it was that I built all this stuff up. Uh, there's a few speed modules down here, granted, but we're currently just trying to catch up on with these particular cards. Ah. I might take a look at that because this feels like this is a problem for a lot of our production. Um, although that's if I, yeah, if I look in the train system over here, we can see that we have we have reasonable numbers of a lot of them, a lot of the catalogs. But we seem to be short of the tier twos. So yes, I shall I shall take a look at that in the next stream and. Um, uh, basically speed up all of these machines around here maybe put some faster belts if I need to but basically allow us to start making these these uh, they, these these cards here in particular a lot more quickly uh, we see actually we seem to have plenty of supply here so maybe just put speed moduling these machines and then seeing how the rest of the system copes would be the way to do it that was a little bit of a tangent but uh so I say I'm, I'm basically trying to imply that the beryllium is beryllium supply is looking reasonably good. And if we look over here, there is some in a warehouse. The train has gone off, so the train is taking some somewhere. However, and oh, and there's only 30 left in here. So when the train comes back, it's not going to be able to fill up properly. However, there is a spaceship here that has about 75,000 in it. So once it's finished unloading all of the, the byproducts and the trash that's brought back with it, and the beryllium actually starts to flow out, then we'll be able to fill this back up again. The train will come back, it'll be able to fill up, and we'll probably be okay. Uh, it, it remains to be seen where, just how okay we are. Uh, we can't really tell until, until we've got a train stopped here. Once we have a train parked in the station completely full and not going anywhere, then we know we've filled up all the buffers and everything is going well. But until that point, all I can say is that it looks like I feel like we are filling up buffers at this point and things are going very, very well. And here we go, here comes the beryllium now. That seems to be being randomly, randomly we're now just unloading huge chop quantities of beryllium. Um, I'm certainly not complaining about that. We're now fill so I'm filling this one up. When it gets to, what is it, 100 stacks, I think, for a, uh, for a, a two-wagon a two, uh, space train, then we'll, we'll have enough to fill the train up. And here is the train. There's only about half a train's worth available, but, you know, still, we can, fill, we can start filling a train up. And I'm sure, well, I'm cautiously optimistic that the uh, things are going to be reasonably going reasonably well let's wait a moment and find out here we go the train is nearly full and the train the train is full ah it's going off again okay so we still have demand we are still filling up buffers around the factory uh we haven't satisfied everything yet with the train however there is as, as, as i said seventy-five thousand flowing in over here which is 750 stacks i think uh, so that's that's going to be that's a good healthy amount. That's like te seven train loads, and so I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that things are going to be okay. And looking back over in Talos orbit, we've even already got another ten thousand in the uh, in, in the warehouses already, and the spaceship hasn't even left. So by the time it gets back, I would expect us to have at least twenty thousand available for it to pick up. And so that'd be about well, I guess that'd be about a third full based on the numbers we were seeing before. I think things are running fairly healthily over here. I will continue to keep an eye on it, of course, but I think things are going quite well at this point.
Okay, that has been a fair amount of talking. I think this is a good place to split the videos. Now, I have a bit of an, an apology to put in here. I have a rather busy weekend coming up, and so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to have the videos coming out quite as neatly and quickly as they should be. Uh, they will still appear. However, I, there is a chance that they may come out on Tuesday and Thursday of next week for the other two, um, depending on when I manage to get them processed. I will pull, put them out as soon as I can, but they might have to end up coming out after the next stream. Uh, if, if that does happen, then I apologise. But, um, yeah, life, life has got a got away with me a little bit this week and I've not been quite as organised as I should be. Still, the videos will be there. They will either be Saturday, Sunday as usual, uh, or they'll be Tuesday, Thursday, or some combination of that. I'm not sure. We shall see. But we'll definitely be back on Monday for another stream where we should be carrying on with the Naquium production, getting that running faster, keeping an eye on the beryllium, and just building everything up bigger and better and faster and stronger and all those sort of wonderful things. I'll be back on Wednesday as well for another satisfactory stream, and that's going really well. I finished off another intermediate in the last uh, stream. We've now got turbo motors, and th that's going to allow me to make some more of uh, some uh, various things, including including tier 3 mining drills and some more of the things that aren't actually science packs but I'm kind of pretending they are because that's sort of how they work in the game. So that's, that, yeah, there's a lot going on there, so that's definitely another stream worth coming along to, so I hope to see you on that one. That's, both streams are 7.30pm UK time as always, and then of course next weekend there'll be some more videos coming out with the updates from the last stream and hopefully I'll have been a little bit more organised and they'll come out a bit more neatly as, uh, as usual. So, thank you very much for watching, please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on all the other content that's coming out on the channel, and I shall see you next time. Bye-bye.